lassoing a wounded shark in life or death emergency surgery at sea. We've got to get close enough to this animal where we're hugging it. Dave, oh. Dave, can you hear me? Cliff diving into disaster on an insane mission for giant trevally. You're going, oh my god, how am I going to stop this thing? A face to face thresher shark showdown <laughs> on a surfboard. When you've got a frenzied shark in the water with you, you've got a problem on your hands. And a deadly fishing skirmish, wrestling a mammoth bass barehanded. I sank to the bottom. All I saw was green bubbles and rocks. I thought I was going to die. Forget fishing as usual. It's the world's most outrageous adventure angling. Epic battles of man versus fish pushed to the edge of courage, endurance, and obsession. Uncover the bravest ocean encounters on Earth in Hooked Extreme Angling. On ambitious quests, in remote locations, with custom adventure gear, they risk it all in the most terrifying tests of angler versus behemoth beast. In these treacherous clashes of extreme sportsmen against ocean predator, some fishermen dare to do the impossible, pushing the limits of experience, luck, and survival to the breaking point. Nick, we'll need to get those other tanks, too. For one group of scientists on a mission to save a dying deep-sea hunter, it's going to take some of the most extreme and daring fishing they've ever attempted. Byron Bay, Australia, July 16, 2008. Marine biologist and professional sea rescuer Trevor Long gets an urgent call. When was the last time you saw her? Kilometers from shore, divers have spotted a 2.9 meter sand tiger shark in dire distress. Make sure you don't forget that, uh, that tether line, will you? I'll just get this hoop out. Incredibly, a four foot hooked fishing gaff is stuck deep in the animal's throat. Don't forget that line, Nick. Yep. Trevor quickly assembles a team of top veterinarians, biologists, and animal recovery pros. Though no amount of experience can guarantee their safety, Operation Shark Rescue is on. Okay, guys, we're out of here. Heading out aboard the rescue vessel SeaWorld One, with each second, Trevor and his team are on borrowed time. In parts of the world, sand tiger sharks are critically endangered. Saving any of them is vital, but this shark is in serious trouble. This animal cannot feed, it can't forage, it can't, it can't obtain any prey whatsoever. If we don't remove it, there's only one situation that's going to happen here, this shark's going to die. The team's target? Meet one of nature's scariest cannibals. Natural born predators, sand tiger sharks are programmed to attack and devour anything that crosses their path. From infancy, a sand tiger's mission is brutally simple kill or be killed. In the womb, the first sand tiger egg hatched already carries cutting jaws. Infanticidal and hungry, it turns on its siblings, feeding until no one's left. So what happens, mum has a range of animals in the uterus. The, the, the fittest of those animals will feed, actually feed on the others and consume them. And only that female only have one or two pups at the end of the day. If you think about it, you're gonna have a really aggressive animal that comes out of this really awful process. And as they grow, sand tigers only get more lethal. Nicknamed the ragged tooth shark, one look and it's easy to see why. Over 80 stabbing, jutting fangs turn their mouths into predatory pincushions. Sand tigers, they've got a lot of teeth, a lot of big teeth, and they're really raggedy. They got all these gnarly edges to them. A relative of the great white, 
sand tiger sharks grow to whopper sizes. Over three meters long, weighing nearly 160 kilos. But they get even more dangerous when these warm water hunters naturally swim close to shore and encounter humans. With 29 unprovoked attacks on record, sand tigers have earned a lethal reputation. Man-eaters. Yet in reality, sand tigers are more often the victim of our commercial overfishing, bycatch, and habitat destruction. Still, though we must help to save the species, be warned, they're dangerous. Like any powerful predator, a threatened sand tiger can turn deadly. These animals have a mouthful of teeth, and if you get your hand anywhere near them, you're gonna get your hand bitten off. And now, Trevor Long and the rescue team aboard SeaWorld One plan to wrangle an injured tiger shark head on. The shark to the boat, Trevor plans to lasso it. The technique requires a special tool, a custom spring-loaded lasso that propels rope towards the target. Once the trigger's pulled, spring clips release, securing the rope around the beast. But roping a shark safely takes more than special tools. It takes intense training and marksman-like precision. And there's always a risk getting so close to a killer fish. Now, to save this dying beast, they first got to find it more than four hours out at sea. The team makes its way to the rocky outcrop where the shark was first spotted. They can only hope the animal's still there and alive. An injured shark's behavior is violently unpredictable. Yet, the team's got to perform emergency surgery. Now, we're going to go down, pluck this animal out of the ocean, bring it on board, and then somehow get this gaff out of it and release it alive. This isn't an easy exercise. Arriving at their target location, Trevor prepares his custom shark lasso. I would go down and hopefully be able to locate the animal, but we didn't know how long it was going to take to fight the animal to get it back to the boat. The murky water makes visibility a serious challenge. Then, a breakthrough. Trevor spots the shark circling near the rocks and can't believe his eyes. It's enormous stretching nearly three meters long. Now, the game has changed. With the shark in sight, Trevor needs to make sure the beast doesn't see him. If the shark spots Trevor or the crew, it might flee, or worse, the shark could turn on the divers, attacking in self-defense. Trevor positions himself above the shark's blind spot. If his shot misses, the spook beast will be lost. Aiming carefully, Trevor focuses, fires, and hits his target. He's got the lasso on. But the danger mounts. At any moment, the shark's sharp teeth could shred the line. Even worse, the animal's now attempting to swim away. If Trevor holds on, the shark could drag him deep into open ocean. Trevor's only hope is to gain more leverage and turn the dying shark back towards the boat. He hovers directly overhead, getting closer and closer. Any shark in a fight response where it's got a rope around it it, it can be dangerous, and we've got to get close enough to this animal where we're hugging it almost. Up close, Trevor assesses the damage. The one plus meter fishing gaff is deeply embedded in the shark's throat. A submerged plexiglass tube is used to hold the injured shark still while the crew hoists the animal onto the boat. Though the tube is sized for a large shark, it's risky. 
If the contraption fits too tightly, it could push the swallowed fishing gaff even further down the shark's throat. The team slowly maneuvers the tube toward the mammoth monster. To prevent a lethal rupture, Trevor needs to stabilize the thrashing animal immediately. Staying calm as possible, with the shark still struggling, the team manages to get the tube in place, sliding the beast all the way in. But as feared, the gaff moves deeper into the shark's throat. They've got to get the injured predator to the boat and fast. As everyone holds their breath, a special winch shoulders the precious cargo into a waiting tank on board. In the boat at last, speed is critical. The gaff has to come out. First, to sedate the shark, the team uses a deceptively simple strategy, flipping the animal over. In this inverted position, a shark falls into a temporary trance called tonic immobility. Scientists are only beginning to understand the phenomenon, but they do know the amount of time the trance lasts is unpredictable. Sharks will come into a very calm state if you can roll them on the back. Now, we've still got to be very careful. This animal can bite. With the shark briefly sedated, the team inserts a thick plastic tube down its throat. The tube allows veterinarians to reach down and remove the gaff. The vet can put his hand down the pipe to make himself safe from those all those ragged, sharp teeth. But even with the pipe in place, the vet's operation requires a steady hand and even steadier nerves. Suddenly, something goes wrong. Mid-procedure, the vet tries to loosen the gaff from outside the protective tubing. That tube came out of the shark's mouth. It's going to, you know, literally tear the skin and deep into that, that, that vet's arms. For nearly an hour, the painstaking operation continues as the vet struggles to unhook the gaff and safely remove it. As the crew watches, after a tense 40 minutes, at last, with a careful push, the veterinarian feels the hook release from the shark's throat. Guiding the gaff pole up and out, he's done it. You know, I asked him, I said, Dave, I said, that was absolutely fantastic. And he said, well, he said, failure was not an option. But the mission isn't over yet. For the shark to have any chance of survival, the crew has to get it safely transferred by stretcher back into the water as fast as possible. Before releasing the three meter whopper, the team tags it and quickly administers antibiotics to prevent any wound infection. They then move the beast into position at the side of the boat and carefully lower it down. After about 15 minutes, we could see that the animal got its color back and it was starting to swim in a very normal manner. So we knew at that time that we've, you know, we've been successful. Well you know, many need one chance to even start this thing and, and it's all gone exceptionally well and pretty, we're pretty happy with that. To this day, no one knows how the gap got lodged in the shark's throat. But regardless of the cause, Trevor and his crew's mission to rescue this remarkable animal is a testament to the importance of human intervention to help save threatened species from extinction. Kilometers. Thousands of miles away, another extraordinary angler risks his life for the thrill of battle. 
The Seychelles Atolls, Indian Ocean, February 5th, 2006. International fishing adventurer and intrepid fly fishing guide, Peter McLeod, will go anywhere to catch whoppers. Remote locations mean big fish and the most extreme catches. It's pristine wilderness environment. You get that kind of environment, then the fishing's gonna be off the clock. Peter's come to the Seychelles for one reason, to land one of the area's most notorious undersea adventure angling opponents, the giant Trevally. There's something just primevally aggressive and rather, you know, insane about giant Trevally. In a world of whopper fish, giant Trevallis, GTs for short, are like hit and run hunters, striking with brutal precision and speed. Their stalking style? Bite first, ask questions later. When Trevally are feeding, they hit hard, they hit fast, prey just flies out of the water. With few competitors and even fewer natural enemies, GTs can grow big as bathtubs, over one and a half meters long, weighing more than 70 kilograms. Muscle-bound brutes built with thick shoulders, blunt heads, and heavy torsos, these giants strike at any potential prey. Trevally just run things down. They don't care if the prey sees them a mile off, they just blast into them. Despite their bulk, a crescent-shaped caudal fin rockets them through the water with power and agility. Trevallis have that big curved tail, which helps them accelerate really quickly. And for adventure anglers like Peter McLeod, it all adds up to one of the toughest fighting fish on the planet. It's known as the bulldog of the ocean. Now, as Peter reaches his shoreline fishing spot along the atoll's rugged terrain, the angler scans the waters for shadowy movement. To get a better look, Peter decides to head for higher ground. Climbing rocks in the middle of the Indian Ocean is risky business. Yet for Peter, it's the only way to get a leg up on his adversary. I climbed up one of these overhanging coral outcrops, probably 12, 15 feet up. It's literally like walking on lunar landscape. I mean, this thing is like really vicious. It's all dead coral reef. So you've got to be very, very careful. Scanning from the top, the water's clear as glass. The angler spots his target, a giant trevally ahead. It's huge and heading straight towards him. And there I see Plum, Plum sitting there is this massive GT, about 35 pounds. So the heart starts going and I'm beginning to go, <laughs> getting really, really excited about it. Wasting no time, Peter casts his line. In a flash, the voracious Trevally swallows the hook and takes off. The mammoth fish peels off line in a rush, showing no sign of stopping. And it's like being attached to a bus. It's probably the best description. The take is just bang, hits you like a ton of bricks, and then suddenly everything's fizzing out of you, and you're going, oh my god, how am I going to stop this thing? As more line strips out, Peter's increasingly alarmed. Perched at the top of a jagged cliff, embroiled in a tug of war, he's at high risk. So if I lacerate the hell out of myself on this coral, I'm in real trouble. We are moored 10 hours sail away from the nearest atoll that we can get a plane into. And from there, it's a three and a half hour flight. To save the catch, the extreme angler decides he has only one option. Jump. I'm thinking, I'm going to have to get down there so I can put some side strain on this fish. I'm going to have to get from here down to there very, very quickly. With no idea what's in the water beneath him, Peter grabs hold of his fly rod as tight as he can and leaps off the cliff. Yeah. 
In the water, the fisherman needs to gather his wits and get back to the fight fast. The Trevally continues to strip off line from the reel. It's like spinning like a propeller, absolutely going mental. This fish is howling out. And Peter's fighting another risk. The hook could slip free. Committed to catch and release, he only uses hooks with the barbs removed. A growing practice among conservation-minded anglers, barbless hooks come out cleanly for a safe release. But they can also get loose during a fight. So as soon as you have any form of lack of tension, then the hook will just drop out and the fish is gone. With this once-in-a-lifetime catch, losing the hook now would be devastating. To maintain as much tension as possible on the line, Peter struggles to get to solid ground. I mean, it's, it's hard work. You're grunting. Your back's beginning to go and you're thinking, oh, Christ, this isn't fun anymore. As he manages to reel the tiring fish almost close enough to touch, Peter reaches out to its tail. With a final pull on his fly rod, at last, Peter brings the monster to him. He's got his prized fish in hand. Up close, it's a trophy GT. At 90 centimeters long, 76 centimeters around, and weighing roughly 18 kilos, it's not the biggest GT Peter's ever caught, but it's one of the most extreme catches he's ever risked. Angler marvels over the phenomenal fish, but only for a moment. The feeling when you pull that fish out of the water is just sheer elation. I mean, it's insane. But most important thing, we get that fish back in the water very quickly. He's gradually beginning to power away. He's getting his strength back. With a little help recovering, the fish swims away safe. And then, he's off, he's off in my hand, I'm good. Thank you! Around the world, when extreme fishermen push the sport to its deadly limit, they take on the ocean's ultimate opponents. And in daredevil battles of angler versus beast, these monster predators are like stealth assassins. The Thresher Shark. This is an animal that's built to swim fast. So they will pursue their prey at great speeds and then essentially sneak up, stun them, come back around and consume them. Thresher sharks can reach mammoth proportions. Record setters have stretched over seven and a half meters, weighing over 340 kilos. And when it comes to the hunt, threshers wield a deadly weapon, their tails. Thresher tail fins stretch over half the length of their bodies. I think of all the fish in the ocean, uh, threshers clearly have the most unique way of getting prey. They swim right through a school of fish, knocking them around with that upper lobe of, of their tail fin, and then come around and pick up the injured. This stunning attack style makes threshers a formidable foe in and out of the water. The same deadly design threshers use to deliver a powerful blow also helps them accelerate rapidly, propelling themselves straight out of the water. Any angler tough enough to tangle with a thresher knows they're in for a fight with some scary surprises. Add a surfboard into the mix, and it's fishing at its most extreme. When you're fishing from the board, one of the exciting things about it is you're, you're in their element, and that, that kind of levels the playing field. La Jolla, California, July 7th, 1998. Extreme angler Scott Cherry sets out for a typical day of fishing. Yet Scott's idea of fishing is anything but typical. With rod, reel, and surfboard, he's on the hunt 
for sharks. From blue sharks to white tips, Southern California's a known shark lair. You get into a battle with one of these things, if you don't know what you're doing, you know, you're, you've got your life on the line. You can really get yourself in trouble. Though dangerous, catches usually stretch only a few meters, weighing just a few dozen kilos. But the surf angler has no idea the behemoth beast he's about to encounter. Paddling out to his favorite fishing spot, Scott casts and sets his line to troll from the back of his board. Suddenly, the angler sees something in the distance. Looking closely, he spots a fin. It's a shark. I was doing that slow troll with the live bait and dragging that bucket of chum, and I looked off to my left and I saw it this beast screaming along the surface for about 50 yards and then and then dove and he disappeared and just a few moments later I hooked up. Unsure what he's hooked, one thing Scott does know, whatever it is, it's a monster. It's pulling hard and fast. As Scott struggles to stay in control, his strategy is daring. Hang on and take a wild ride. You just get this jolt of energy. It's pure adrenaline. But as Scott fights to stay hooked and stay on the surfboard, he suddenly catches a glimpse of something frightening. A whip-like tail emerging from the surf. Scott's now certain this is no ordinary shark. It's a massive thresher and it's on the other end of Scott's line. He's hooked a raging beast. Scott tries to hang on, pulling back to set the hook, but the thresher drags him across the water like a torpedo. We just took off. I think at one point we had to be doing 10 knots. I knew this was a big beast. Yet the thrill soon turns to fear. The thresher is pulling Scott and his board over eight kilometers out into open ocean. In these shark-infested waters, the thresher's showing no signs of slowing down. Scott must take control before he's dragged out too far to make it back to shore. Yet stopping a fish in its tracks and turning it around from a surfboard requires tremendous strength from muscles already exhausted from battle. Line was still paying out. So I put my thumb on the spool and put my legs in the water and kicked backwards a little bit and turned her around. Through sheer determination, Scott's strategy works. With the shark turned around, the angler attempts again to reel in the monster. But the thresher isn't giving in without a fight. For 45 minutes, Scott struggles. And just when he thinks things can't get any more extreme, he gets a better glimpse of his opponent. This beast jumped and cleared the water completely. And at that point, I, I knew that I had a big battle on my hands. Incredibly, the epic combat rages for three and a half hours. With what's left of his strength, Scott gives a powerful pull. This time, he's got it. The shark comes to the surface, caught. It's truly huge, nearly the length of the surfboard. Scott believes in fishing sustainably for food, but somehow, he's got to haul this massive beast miles back to shore. And the catch is about to take a turn for the terrifying. Hefting the shark onto the board, Scott's careful to keep from tipping over. As he begins to paddle back, something brushes against him. It's another shark. Felt something hit my leg, felt like a bat hit my leg. I just threw, ow! I looked down, and there was a shark, just absolute frenzy. 
bull sharks, tiger sharks, and gargantuan great whites all call the southern coast of California home. Scott can only guess who's hunting him and his catch. Already tired from an epic fishing struggle, now nearing total exhaustion and fighting fear, Scott paddles furiously, trying to keep the hunting shark at bay. The surf angler never gets a close look at his pursuer, but he can feel its presence. At that point, I was really moving on that board. An incredible three and a half hours after he set out, paddling back through shark-infested waters, Scott makes it to shore, alive, unhurt, with his mammoth catch intact. We brought it up on the beach and laid it down across my surfboard. It was almost the length of my 12-foot surfboard. The Whopper measures 3.3 meters long and weighs 63 and a half kilos. It's believed to be the largest fish ever caught from a surfboard. An incredible victory for a truly extreme angler. It's taking everything that you've got. It's taking a lot of time, and it's uh, when you finally catch the thing and you've secured it, it makes you feel like and Tarzan. Across a continent, when it comes to extreme encounters of man versus whopper, nothing levels the playing field like taking the battle deep into the fish's turf. And for one adventure angler, suiting up and swimming out alone, it's the ultimate test of endurance, strength, and nerve. Skishing. <laughs> like an angler's triathlon, skishing combines swimming, scuba diving, and fishing. <laughs> the master of the sport, Paul Melnick. A pro who believes in stacking the odds against himself. Adventure angling pushed to the limit. People often ask me why I just don't get a boat. Boats are bogus. What's the point of fun or skill in standing in a boat? I really, really enjoy putting myself in positions that are on the edge. I have no intention of dying in a bed. Paul's most prized opponent the striped bass. Able to stretch over 180 centimeters long, weighing more than 55 kilos, they're kings of their offshore domain. The thing about striped bass is you get them in the surf and they can really utilize water motion. They put that big slab side against a rip current or against a tide and you try to pull them in and it's like, it's like pulling against a boulder. For an obsessed skisherman, Hooking a speeding striped bass is an intense thrill, but wrestling one barehanded can become a showdown of life and death. You are on his grounds. He has the same chance of drowning you as you have of killing it. Just that fact makes it extremely thrilling. Montauk, Long Island, New York, September 15, 2005. This historic fishing town is a mecca for anglers trying to land big bass. Long Island bass fishing is a traditional sport. Until Paul Melnick enters the game. While other anglers line up along the coast, Paul's in a wetsuit. To catch big offshore bass, Paul swims past the breakers toward a rocky outcrop. Just over 90 meters out, perched on the jagged rocks, Paul likes the vantage point. But experience has taught him, out here, he's got to be extremely careful. Crashing in the surf and hitting your face on a rock, bad thing. Being grabbed by a riptide uh, hauled down the beach, off into the distance, bad thing. Fog is a really bad thing. I've gotten caught in the fog. You cramp up because of the exertion of fighting the fish. 
you can drown, obviously. Drowning is the number one bad thing. Casting into the turbulent waters, Paul knows Chabi Surf is exactly where bass like to hunt. Bass love to feed at the surf line because the waves are throwing tons and tons of oxygen into the water. Suddenly, the fisherman feels a tug on the line, then a jolt. Paul reels in fast, keeping constant tension. I gave it a good tug. Next thing that happens is I'm being, I'm having the fight of my life with God knows what this was. There's no time to wonder what he's hooked. A huge swell pushes Paul up off the rocks. The fighting fish takes over, dragging the angler into open water. At that moment, you know, the fight was on. And I was, I was free. It was obviously a big fish because it was dragging me all over the place. It had me on my face, it had me upside down. Far from shore, Paul is repeatedly dragged under deeper and deeper. I was in the middle of a current that was moving about six knots, and it was moving out to sea. I thought I was gonna die. Forcing himself not to panic, refusing to lose the catch, Paul leans back and tries to use his opponent's powerful pull to his advantage. I figured out that if you sit in a, in a, in a semi-prone position and kicked, you could fight back on the fish. Instinct and experience tell Paul he's battling a whopper striped bass. No matter how fast he reels, the fish won't quit. Every time the angler thinks he's got it beat, the fish takes off again for deeper water. Striped bass are, are a very strong animal. Uh, the fact that they pull you all over the ocean is testimony to that. It fought like a, like a trooper, like a linebacker. But Paul's just as determined. Treading water, kicking forcefully as he can, he begins to inch the fish closer and closer towards him. Now, with the beast in range, Paul pounces. Using maximum force to stay upright in the powerful current, he swim wrestles the fish. Paul's got the fish in his arms. He's face to face with his whopper striped bass. But the battle isn't over yet. Though his body's aching, Paul's still far from shore. Entering survival mode, he channels all his remaining strength, focusing on kicking and getting back to dry land. With his catch trailing behind him, the adventure angler finally makes it to shore. Success. The Whopper Bass stretches over 120 centimeters, weighing nearly 22 kilos. A true test of skill and a triumph Paul Melnick will never forget. It's like a special forces mission that you've successfully achieved. It's that pure, macho, I did it, I did it. This is a unique experience and I did it. In the opposite hemisphere, another passionate sportsman pushes fishing to the limit. In the world of outrageous adventure angling, extreme weather can be dangerous or an extreme advantage. Braving conditions others won't dare, some obsessed fishermen catch a big wind to land even bigger fish. Kite fishing. The boats might be land based for two months in the winter I've seen it and I'm out there kite fishing getting the big snappers. Taranaki, New Zealand, September 22, 2006. Winter on the coast is brutally cold. 
high winds make the volcanic black sand beaches even more inhospitable. The local catch? Snapper, a fish known to lurk over three kilometers offshore. Not the best conditions for your average shorecaster. But Jeff Preston is anything but average. A lot of my mates think I'm mad doing it because it's bloody cold in the winter. This cold, windy day is no different. As Jeff sets up on the beach, he knows exactly where the snappers go to hunt. Of the over 100 species of snapper worldwide, the razor-toothed specimens who frequent these waters can live as long as 60 years, stretch almost a meter, and weigh over 18 kilos. Skittish and streamlined, these snapper always put up a fight. But to take this prized food fish on, Jeff Preston doesn't own a boat. He also doesn't use a fishing pole. His method? Casting his line by kite flying. Kite enables me to get my line out way past the dirty water, which usually the big fish won't come near a mile or even up to two miles. The goal of kite fishing is to drag bait along the ocean floor, making it look like fast swimming fish, enticing larger fish to pounce. To kite fish, a fisherman attaches multiple baited hooks to a kite line, uses a weight for ballast, and waits for a strong wind to carry the kite fishing contraption out to sea. Jeff is experienced, but any kite fishing expedition can easily go wrong. Some days you've got howling winds and every day's different. There's never many days where it's actually perfect. The fisherman tries to get the kite up repeatedly, but difficult wind currents are making it almost impossible. After several attempts, the kite catches a strong gust. She goes. Jeff's now confident. The game is on. Get out! Kite fishing takes patience. With his line drifting out to sea, Jeff bides his time for several hours. All of a sudden, there's a strong tug. Something's hooked, and it's powerful. It was heavy from the first initial pulling. It was a good mile offshore. Jeff starts hoisting the line, first pulling it out of the water, and then cranking fast as he can. Time is critical. Jeff knows he's got to get his catch to the beach quickly. With each passing second, the fish could escape or be devoured by sharks. Then he sees it. Oh, he's a good size! He's a good size! Even at a distance, the kite fisherman is amazed. This beast is big. Yes, we've got a nice snapper! So I have had them get off through being too impatient, because if they lip hop, they can rip in the waves as the wave, the back pressure of the wave goes out. <laughs> The angler pulls for a staggering two hours. Trying to reel in his monster catch from notoriously shark-infested waters, the kite fisherman yanks as hard as he can. To make matters worse, Jeff suddenly feels extra weight on the line. As he pulls it up, it's covered with lemon sharks hungry for a feast. The angler takes decisive action in an effort to shake the sharks. With a challenging full body hoist, he gets his monster catch closer to shallow water. The strategy works, but now, worried his line will break, Jeff heads straight into the crashing surf. Everything depends on the next few seconds. He's got to wrangle the fish carefully, thrashing in the white water. Many fish spit the hook and speed off. Reaching down for the writhing whopper, Jeff's skill pays off. Yep, good Kite one. fishing mission accomplished. 
stunned by the size of the fish. Jeff's certain it's a record. It's the heaviest snapper he's ever held. I was the only one around and I didn't, I was yahooing to myself. <laughs> when I went to lift the bin off the beach onto the pot, that's when I realized the weight of it. Measured on shore, it's official. Over 15 and a half kilos, 91 centimeters. One of the biggest snappers ever caught off the Taranaki coast. An incredible battle of man versus beast. One by kite. For food fishermen like Jeff, such whopper catches offer proof of the sea's bounty in places where conditions are too extreme for anything but sustainable angling. As fish populations dwindle around the world from commercial overfishing, extreme angling may offer a clue to recovery and future species survival. Innovative approaches that extract the animal that you want without taking the other things from the environment is definitely the wave of the future. In the untamed oceans, in insane conditions, these brave anglers defy the odds, taking on the most daring challenges and colossal combat. As they face off against these astounding underworld creatures, we marvel at the most death-defying encounters of man versus amazing monster fish in Hooked Extreme Angling. <laughs>